Morning, everyone. Welcome to Pepperell Christian Fellowship. We are glad you're here. Special welcome to anyone visiting with us this morning, and I know we have uh, some folks for the Litchfield family. Glad that you are here. Um, we would love to connect with anyone who's visiting. If you'd like to find out more about our church, you can grab one of these welcome packs in the foyer, and there's a little card, welcome card. If you fill that out and give us your information, we'd love to follow up with you and be in touch over the course of the week. If you fill out one of these cards, you can put it in the box, one of those two boxes on the back wall. And we would love to get to know you and uh, let you know more about our church and follow up with you during the week. Happy Mother's Day to all the, the ladies who are here. We're thankful to God for the wise and kind and loving moms among us, as well as the grandmothers and the aunts and all the women who invest in us. And we celebrate your impact on our lives. I know Mother's Day can be painful for some, and already this morning we've been praying for, for mothers who are grieving, maybe missing a child or hurting because of a child who's struggling, praying that God will comfort and strengthen you, and a little bit later in this service we're going to have a, an opportunity to, to celebrate you moms and thank you. Just a few announcements at the beginning of the service here, uh, two announcements for guys. We have a men's hike of Mount Watedic in Ashburnham this coming Saturday May 14, so later this week, and I hope I'm already seeing one guy who's unsure whether he could make it up to the top of that mountain. It's a short mountain. It's a little mountain. It's possible for all of us. I hope many of you men and your sons will join us. Uh, it'll be an evening hike, so we'll start at 6 p.m. We'll meet at the Watadic parking lot on Route 119 at 6 p.m., so bring some water, bring a snack. We'll have a great time. If you have any questions, you can contact Christopher White, who's here this morning, and his info is in the, the bulletin. His phone number's in the bulletin, so give him a call if you have questions. Also for men, on Saturday, June 4, we're going to paint the home of a dear woman in our congregation right here in Pepperell, remove some dead trees on her property. I think it'll be a great way to serve and have fun together at the same time. You don't need any special skills, so if you have a willing heart and you want to hang out with some guys and serve a woman in our congregation, please join us. And Christopher White is, is asking for RSVPs for that so he can organize a work crew. So, again, contact him or you can contact the church office. Uh, quick heads up and invitation for everyone that our mission partners, Josh and Abby Ratton, are going to be visiting uh, with us next Sunday. They work in Uganda. Uh, Josh is going to be preaching, and then they'll stay afterward for a potluck following the second service. Everyone is invited to that potluck, and you'll see in the bulletin some more info if your last name begins with A to L, please bring a main dish or side. And if your last name begins with M to Z, please bring a dessert. And then finally, uh, we have some important volunteer needs. We're going to be um, this summer doing Service Sunday and Marching in the Parade. And we're giving away T-shirts this morning. Doug is giving away T-shirts. He's taking orders to give away T-shirts. So if you'd like to order T-shirts for you or your family, you can see him after this service. Uh, and then we're, we're running Bible Venture, our, our vacation Bible school program for kids the last week of July. I think one of the best outreach opportunities of the year for us as a church. And um, you'll see in the bulletin, uh, you should have an orange sheet with volunteer needs. Please uh, fill that out. Love for you to join us um, in reaching the kids in our church and our community. And again, if you fill that out, you can put it in the, in the boxes on the back wall. Also still in need of, opportunity, uh, of volunteers for nursery and ushers for Sunday mornings. And if you can help us out with those needs, we'd, we'd really appreciate it. So uh, you can contact Carolyn Bradley and Jake Bronkema if you can, can help us serving as an usher on Sunday mornings or a nursery worker. Just great ways to bless people who are coming on Sundays, and let them know that we're prepared to welcome them and we want to serve them. For our call to worship, I want, to, I want to, he, us to hear and to receive the invitation of God himself. This is spoken through King David. And God himself invites us to come and to praise him because of his great mercy to us. And so we are here this morning, we are approaching God by His invitation. We come because He invites us to come. I want us to hear how He invites us to respond to Him and also why. 
This is Psalm 30, verses 4 and 5. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. I wonder if you are ready to sing praises to God. And I wonder if you have experienced God's favor in your life. I want you to hear those verses again. This is God's invitation. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. We're going to read all of Psalm 30 now responsively. And Psalm 30 is the man, it's a story of a man who is full of praise because God has delivered him. So if you have experienced the deliverance of God, this is a, this is a psalm for you. Maybe there's some areas of your life where you haven't yet experienced deliverance and you're crying out to God for deliverance. And so it might be that, that as we read this, this is a prayer for you to pray to God, a cry from your heart to God. Just a note that the word sheol is used in this psalm, and that is in the Bible, the place of the dead. I'll read the part of the leader, and I invite you to respond as the congregation. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you've brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Let's pray. Father God, on this Mother's Day, we give you thanks for all the moms and the grandmothers present, all, all the women in our lives who love and care for us. We thank you for, for the godly women of our church who treasure your word and study it and memorize it and teach it in their families. We thank you, Father, for their passionate prayers for their integrity and courage, for their unconditional love. We praise you for gifting the women of our church by your Holy Spirit with enormous creativity and intelligence and energy. And we thank you for how they serve us as a church family. We praise you for how they are raising their children to fear and treasure you. Thank you, Lord, for the late nights and the consoling words, the unseen sacrifices they make. Please encourage them when they feel overwhelmed with busyness or sadness or discouragement. Convict them where there are areas of sin or temptation. Amaze them with the beauty of Christ and allow them to overflow to those around them. Please comfort the moms among us who are hurting today. Please remind them of your fatherly love for all of us, including mothers. 
of your grace for every failure and your goodness for every need. Father, we are grateful that you are our perfect parent, our heavenly Father. And I pray that we will rest in your love as our Father. Even in this this service, as we dedicate Annalise Litchfield to you, pray that we will rest more in your love for us. As we sing praise to your name, as we hear your word proclaimed, that we will rest more deeply, more fully in your fatherly care for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite the Litchfield family up to the front. It is a beautiful thing that on Mother's Day we get to dedicate in this service Annalise Litchfield to the Lord. And in next, the next service we get to dedicate Isaac Batchelor to the Lord. Uh, infant dedication is not infant baptism. Uh, infant dedication is a precious thing. It's not, it's not baptism because at our church we believe that baptism is for those who have professed faith in Christ, who have rested in Him for salvation. Uh, babies can't do that, but uh, we, we love to dedicate babies to the Lord, and as we do so, it's an opportunity for parents to testify to their love of Christ, their trust in Christ, and also their willingness to dedicate their child to the Lord. Uh, Psalm 127 says that children are a gift from the Lord. We can't earn kids. We don't create kids ourselves. They, they come to us as a gift from God. And so in infant dedication, parents in the context of the gathered congregation say to God, we give our, our child to you. And they ask us as a congregation, would you hold us accountable? Would you help us and support us? So we're going to have a, an opportunity to say yes to that a little later. I want to invite uh, the Litchfields just to say a few words um, about... Their, their desires for Annalise, and maybe share a scripture with us. All righty. Good morning, everybody. We are the Litchfields. Actually, let's just pull this out. Um, so I'm Mike, and this is my wife, Caitlin, and then Paul down here is hiding. Stephen is going to turn around now, too, and this is Annalise. So we picked the name Annalise. It's a little bit unusual, but it's kind of a, a combination of two names, Anna, which means grace, and Elise, which is kind of short for Elizabeth, uh, which means God is my bounty. And so together, the two, the two words kind of mean graced with God's bounty. Um, and then joy uh, is short and sweet, and she's a joy to us and a joy to others, and we hope that one day her joy will be found in the Lord. So the verse we have for her is 2 Corinthians 9.8 which says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And so really that's our prayer for her and why we're dedicating her today, um, is that she would be a great recipient of God's grace, that her joy would be found in the Lord, and that she would find joy in serving him throughout her life. And Caitlin just wants to say a few words too. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to take a chance to say thank you um, for those of you who sent cards and gifts and meals and for all of your prayers uh, when she was born. Um, you really made our transition to a family of five really smooth. We were really surprised by that, and we just felt it must be God's work through the body of Christ through you all. So thank you. All right, we love this family, and it's, uh, it's great to as a church family, come around them and hear them make commitments to the Lord. So, Mike and Caitlin, I'm going to ask you a few questions now. You can respond with, uh, we do or we will. Mike and Caitlin, do you dedicate Annalise to the Lord, fully trusting his sovereign wisdom and goodness to her in all circumstances? If so, say we do. Will you commit to speak regularly to Annalise of Christ's love and to bring her up within a body of believers with the hope that one day she will gladly accept Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Will you pledge that to the best of your ability, you will nurture Annalise in the fear and admonition of the Lord, in a stable family environment, teaching her the scriptures, praying regularly that she will grow into a mature believer 
and a productive member of Christ's body. If so, say we will. I want to invite all of us to rise as the Litchfields Church family, uh, supporting Mike and Caitlin and Stephen and Paul and Annalise, and ask you, will you pledge that to the best of your ability and in ways appropriate to your relationships with the Litchfields? You will come around this family in loving support, praying, teaching, supporting them practically for the glory of God and the good of Annalise's soul. If so, say, we will. All right, Annalise, would you just go let me hold it? Go for it. Annalise, she is beautiful. Annalise, we dedicate you to the Lord, and we pray that through the, the dedicated service and prayers of your parents and your extended family and us, your church family, you will come to know and treasure Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for her after returning her to her mother. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, we pray for this dear girl. Uh, We thank you for the Litchfields and all they've meant to us. We've loved to see the boys growing older. And we, we pray, Lord, for Mike and for Caitlin and for the whole family that you will support and sustain them. We pray that these children, particularly Annalise, will be a woman of God will delight in you all her days. Pray that there won't be a day where where she doesn't remember trusting in you and knowing you and hearing of you and treasuring you. Lord, we are really grateful that you've drawn Mike and Caitlin to yourself. We're, We're grateful that they are walking with you. We're grateful that they're part of a church family, that they have deep relationships with folks, and that when we as their church family commit to them, It's a real commitment. We know them and and love them and care for them, and we want to walk with them for the long haul. So, Father, be around this family and and, and particularly rest upon Annalise and draw her to yourself and save her forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Litchfields. God bless you guys. A couple things are going to happen now uh, all at once. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward, and I'm also going to invite any kids, Paul and Stephen, that includes you, even though you're just sitting down, any kids to come on up, and we have carnations in the front, a bunch here and a bunch here, and I would love for you to get carnations and give them to every woman in the sanctuary as a, a Mother's Day gift to say, we love you and are thankful for you. So kids, would you come on up now? And worship team, you can come up now at the same time, and let's distribute those carnations. If you see a woman, guys, if you see a woman who doesn't have one yet, feel free to come on up here and supplement the work of the kids. You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you please. Please rise and worship our holy God.
God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration. of grace to thee we cling from the law hath set us free once and for all on Calvary's hill love and justice shall agree praise the Lord to drink. Why? For my Lord has conquered death. 
victorious forevermore. The ancient foe is slain to rest. Jesus, you are the lamb who was slaughtered, worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. By your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And the heavens worship you for this. And we join them. Amen. Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign, my gracious Of love. 
Please be seated. Well, kids, you did an awesome job handing out the flowers. And now if you are second grade and under, you can go out to Children's Church and go learn about Jesus over with your teachers across the way. Uh, The rest of us will be, I'd love for you to open your Bible to 2 Kings 6, and we're going to look at verses 8 to 23 this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning and you don't have a Bible of your own, uh, raise your hand. Uh, We can get you a Bible. One of our ushers will get one over to you. Uh, And if you don't own a Bible, we would love to give you a Bible. And so you can, on your way out, please take one of those blue covered ones out in the hall, just out those double doors, uh, and take that home with you. That's our gift uh, to you this morning. I also want to just add my, my happy Mother's Day wishes to all the women here uh, this morning. Thank you so much for all you are and all that you do for our families. And uh, I pray that you will be encouraged this morning. And so even though it's Mother's Day, we're going to continue our study of the life and ministry of the prophet Elisha uh, with a continued intent of discovering what he has to teach us about who God is. And my aim, and actually my gift to moms this morning, is I'm hoping to provide renewed hope to you. And, and that's not just for moms. Moms aren't the only ones who need hope renewed. And so that's for all of us. I'm, my prayer is that our hope would be renewed at seeing who our God is. And so there's a lot of hope to be seen in this passage. If you're not already there, turn to 2 Kings chapter 6 and follow along with me as I read that section from 8 to 23. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is the king? (laughs) Called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. It was told him, Behold, he is in Dotham. So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. 
And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast. And when they, laid, they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. This is the word of God for us this morning. So here, the whole passage, if you notice, the whole passage that you just read revolves around seeing. Those who can see are given the ability to see, and those who can't see but are then given the ability to see. And so what, what we're going to, what God wants us to see are these same realities, but in new ways. And there are actually three specific realities of God that are illuminated for us in this passage, and they're outlined in your bulletin. They'll be on the front wall here uh, for you to see. And those three realities of God are the unseen protection of God, the unexpected provision of God, and the undeserved mercy of God. So first, the unseen protection of God. The Bible is actually full of descriptions of, and examples of God's protection. Read through the Psalms, for example. You'll see that God is a rock, a fortress, a deliverer. And scripture is brimming with examples of God delivering his people time and time again from their difficult circumstances. He delivers them out of the hands of the Egyptians, from worldwide floods, from Philistinian giants, from deranged kings, from hungry lions, from gargantuan fish. Over and over, God delivers his people and we know these stories. We, many of us have heard these stories. We tell these stories. We teach these stories. But I wonder what happens to us when we get scared. I mean, really scared. Not a little bit scared. But when are we, when we are terrified, what happens? We know these stories, but often we're tempted to doubt that God really does protect us. What is he going to do for me now? This is hopeless. This is too dangerous. I am too scared. We're not sure that we can trust those promises, those stories, the evidence that we read and see and meditate on. One of the things we're thinking about doing this summer is, as a family is possibly taking a road trip to the Grand Canyon. And one of the things I'd love to do while we're there is go out onto the skywalk. Have you heard of the skywalk? It's a, a glass walk that's 70 feet out over the west rim of the canyon. And it's a glass bottom so you can see right through. And uh, maybe some of you have done it already. I just think it'd be, it's terrifyingly awesome. <laughs> um, and my family agrees with me that it's terrifying. Um, not so much the awesome part of that. And I, and I think what makes it terrifying is that even though you know there's a walkway beneath you and, and you assume that it can hold a lot of weight <laughs> and that they've thought through this carefully, something happens as you look down and all you see is the canyon below you. And, and so no longer do you see this, this, this walkway that is sturdy and solid 
All you see is your death below. There's nothing else. It's just clear right to my death down there. And so we forget that there's any protection at all. And I I see that as a metaphor for the way that we see God's protection. We know in our minds, maybe even we believe in our hearts that he protects us and he has the ability to protect us. But when we're scared, we're tempted to doubt that he truly will come through for us. We actually get two different glimpses of God's unseen protection in this passage. The first, if you go back to verse 9, we see the man of God, that's Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are going down there. He gets a warning of where this army is encamping against him. And for us as readers, We know from reading this that Elisha's advice is true. It's trustworthy. We we see that in in verse 8, that the the servants, the king of Israel, the uh, king of Syria, trusts his servants and he says, This is where we're going to go camp. This is where the army is going to go. Then in verse 11 and 12, Elisha's knowledge of that plan, he tells his king in Israel, And the Syrian king gets word of this, and he's fuming. Who leaked this information? And his servants say, we're innocent. There's this guy, Elisha. I don't know how he does this, but he knows the things you say in secret to us. And so we know that it's true. And then in verse 10, we see that his his advice saves the king of Israel uh, on more than one occasion. This is good advice. Elisha's words, the words that he's received from God as the prophet of God are airtight in their truthfulness. Yet, yet, what is the king of Israel's response to hearing Elisha's true words from God? He sends out his own fact-checking team. Go, go see if this is true. Is there really a Syrian army in that place? Or is Elisha lying to me? And so the king sends out this troop that scouts it out. And indeed, it is true. But he doubts the word of God. From this prophet Elisha. He has to see it for himself in order to believe it. And before we were too quick to judge the king of Israel for his lack of trust of the prophet's words given to him by God. Are we trusting in the words of God given to us in the prophets, in the apostles? Are we trusting them or how much fact checking do we need to do in order to believe the word of God is the word of God and that it's true and trustworthy and his protection is true? How much do we need to see it for ourselves when we see it over and over and over in the pages of Scripture? And we hear testimonies of others even now of God's provision, His protection on them. I think another application of this starts also asking another question of ourselves. And that question is, do we listen to godly advice? If you look at the contrast here, the Syrian king Who's he seek out for advice and wisdom? It's his servants. They don't know any better or have more discernment than he does. But the the king of Israel receives godly wisdom. Wisdom from God. And so he should have listened automatically. It's coming from a godly man. And granted, we don't have prophets in the same sense that we receive new revelation about who God is, but God does impart wisdom to his people. And I would go as far as sometimes God still gives people knowledge that they can only know having God told them. And so what are we doing? What, when we are working through some issues, when we're making decisions about things, what, where do we go for counsel? Are we seeking godly counsel? I can tell you in the process of church planting, having never done it before, I am thankful for godly counsel. 
for the guys that you've heard us talk about in the Village Green Collective, there's a lot of wisdom there in these guys who have experienced what I haven't and have done things right or wrong, but they've gained wisdom through it. I need to listen to that. A second glimpse of God's unseen protection, though, is here. And it's more dramatic than the first. Go back down to verse 14. The king of Syria is so troubled, so he's so worked up, he's shaken up so much. His response is to send horses and chariots and a great army to go capture Elisha, one man. A whole army of horses and chariots to find one man in the middle of the night and they surround Elisha's house. So Elisha's servant wakes up early in the morning like a good servant should and he finds that they're completely surrounded by the Syrian army and guess what his response is? He's terrified. (laughs) This whole city is surrounded by an enemy army. How would you respond? He's, he's terrified. And so he cries out to Elisha in verse 15. Alas, my master, what shall we do? He has no idea how God could ever save them from this. So he cries out to the man of God. What shall we do? Not knowing what God can do, but he's seen Elisha do miracles in the past. His servant has seen this happen. And so he goes to the man who, has, who God has given favor to in the past for salvation, for deliverance. And then I love how Elisha, just calm and collected. There, remember, there's this army surrounding them, horses and chariots all around his house. And what does he say to his servant? Don't be afraid. What? What? <laughs> Don't be afraid. There's an army here to attack us. And I bet all of us in this room have had those times when when someone else was really scared in a scary situation. And we told them, don't be afraid. But inside, we are scared to death of the same exact thing. that's That's not where Elisha is. He's actually confident. He's he's actually not scared, and he's not built into his own confidence in what he can do. But he says this. He says, don't be afraid because those who are with us are more than those who are with them. He sees something the servant can't see at this point. That's the grounds of Elisha's confidence. And so he prays, oh Lord, please open his eyes. My servant needs his eyes open. God gives him the ability to see spiritual reality that there's a God, God's heavenly army is all around. So the mountains we read were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. God gives the servant the ability to see what previously only Elisha saw. With spiritual eyes. That's God's protection was all around them. Let me ask, what what struggles or problems, enemies maybe, that you are facing right now? Are you finding yourself crying out as Elisha's servant? Maybe crying out to God, alas, what am I going to do? What, what am I going to do now? And the reality is many of you are facing legitimately scary things. Not minimizing the things that are in front of you, the challenges you have, the things you are trying to overcome. But amazing are the words of God for us this morning. Don't be afraid. Not because there's no reason for it. There's plenty of reason to be afraid. But Elijah's servant had plenty to be afraid of too. Whole army was there to take them captive, most likely to kill them. But because those who are with us are more than those are with them. See, there's a spiritual reality, a spiritual reality of God's protection surrounding us. And I go back to the skywalk in the Grand Canyon. 
right? And some, some of us are paralyzed at going out there. I hope that's not me. But they were paralyzed at going out on this walk because all we can see is that death below us and not the protection beneath us. We need to take our eyes off our struggles and look to God and re-look at his promises. The stories of his protection and power over and over and over in the Bible. We read it and it's clear, meaning there's, there's nothing bad that will happen to us other than at the hand of God. But it doesn't mean that we will never have bad things happen or face challenges. It does mean we'll always have God's protection. All of God's people have God's protection. And right here, this sounds like the climax of the passage. Where, where do you go from here? But there's two more realities of God that, that this passage illuminates for us. And actually, if I'm being honest, they both surprised me as I studied this passage for this morning. I was caught off guard. I thought the, the high point was seeing this spiritual army all around them. And, and that, that, is, that is impressive and it's good. But there's more. There's more that I think we, we sometimes miss. You could say that God opened my eyes to these things. So the second reality I want us to see about God is his unexpected provision. The unexpected provision of God. So just think about for a moment the cli- this climactic view of this godly army all around them. And the Syrian army now is pressing in against Elisha and his servant. And in this emotionally charged scene, what would you expect to read? I, I, I was expecting, just, to, just in my mind, I was thinking, wouldn't this be a great time for God to just bring in the, those flaming chariots and, and horses and just annihilate the whole army, showing his, his might, his strength, just striking them down. But that's not what we read at all. That's not what we see here. Instead of bringing this whole angelic arsenal to crush the Syrian army, the reality that God just opened the eyes of Elisha's servant to see, he's going to use the simple prayer of Elisha to subdue the whole army. Elisha prays the opposite of what he prayed for his servant and asks God to strike them with blindness. Right now, you're probably saying to yourself, what I said to myself when I first started looking at this, what is God doing here? He has this massive flaming army of chariots. Why not use them, command them to just annihilate them? But he comes back to Elisha and his prayers. That's worth lingering on for a moment. What is God doing when he has all of this at his fingertips? Think about it a little bit more broadly, maybe putting it this way. God has everything at his disposal, but involves his people and their dependence on him in prayer to deliver us from our problems. This isn't just true for Elisha. This is true for all of us. Our biggest battles in life, there is always a heavenly army ready and waiting. God could do whatever he wants with those. He could fight them in any way. Yet most of the time, God is going to not simply annihilate our enemies, get rid of them completely. Most of the time, Often, it's going to use our dependence on him through our prayers so that we have increased awareness of the extent of his strength and his protection. It's yet another way that the, it shows the extent of his sovereignty over, over all things. He doesn't have to use the most impressive. In fact, he doesn't often use the most impressive means He can accomplish all he wills by whatever means he wills, regardless of how small. And so it is true that God usually uses ordinary means to produce extraordinary results. Ordinary means producing 
extraordinary results. But don't miss the link here. God often carries this out through our prayers. Have you ever asked, do our prayers matter? Do my prayers to God matter at all? This passage proves, yes, absolutely your prayers matter. God uses them. He responds to them. And so when God's people pray in the will of God, it's ensured that the purposes of God will be carried out in response to those prayers. That's, that's a guarantee of the Bible. If you are praying in God's will, those things, if they are God's will, will happen. That's what Elisha is experiencing. That is what Elisha's servant is now seeing. Let's jump back into our text So to recap, we have the man of God that God enables to see spiritual realities, a servant that he helps to see the same realities, and an enemy that has just been struck blind. Again, at this point, the army hears, somehow hears and listens to Elisha as he leads them right into the presence of the king of Israel in Samaria. Elisha prays similarly to what he did earlier For the servant, he says, O Lord, open the eyes of these men. And the Lord answers that prayer again. Their eyes are opened. And instead of seeing God's conquering army like Elijah's servant, they see that they have just been conquered. They open their eyes and they're in Samaria, enemy territory, surrounded by their enemies in front of the king. They are done. If this was a movie, I just, I just envisioned the camera panning to the faces of the, the army here and just drop in shock at we were pursuing this man and all of a sudden we find ourselves in the midst of enemy territory, captured. And then it would pan over to the king of Israel who's just wringing his hands at his good fortune. The army shows up at my doorstep. God just delivers them literally, to my front door. And so I'm sure this army is just seeing death. That's that's what they see when they open their eyes. And then the king, I said he was wringing his hands. I get that from verse 21. Addressing Elisha, he says, my father, shall I strike them down? And he says it not just once. Because I'm sure he's seething with vengeance for the enemy. And he says it again, shall I strike them down? He's like a little kid here. Can I do it? Can I? Can I? Can I? (laughs) He's eager to crush the enemy. But this dramatic scene takes another colossal turn right here. It was another surprise that I didn't see coming as I prepared. It goes in a completely new direction that helps us see a final reality illuminated. And that's God's undeserved mercy towards us. The undeserved mercy of God. What we see here is instead of the king of Israel getting what he wants and going ahead to take the army's life, Elisha essentially says, that's not what we do here. (laughs) What? (laughs) Remember, what is happening here? He, he's, he's saying, don't put this army to death. The army that showed up to take Elisha and most likely kill him, don't put them to death. What's he say? Here's a way to get back at them. Give them bread and water. Give them bread and water. Again, we ask, God, what are you doing here? We, we have the enemy right where we want them. And you're telling us, give them bread and water. And so it's a, it's a shocking suggestion. And what God is doing here is pouring out his mercy through Elisha. After being delivered from his enemies, it's clear God is winning here. Elisha actually extends that same mercy that, that mercy of God that produced peace, he is extending that. And this is a crucial thing for us to know about the God of the Bible. He's a merciful God. 
It's all over the Bible. A few examples. Deuteronomy 4.31 says, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. Psalm 103, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. At the beginning of the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. As we've been learning in our life groups and studying the book Gentle and Lowly together, we're guided to see that God's heart for us is merciful. Not this big ogre in the sky just waiting for you to mess up again and then punishing you. He's a merciful God. That's his heart, that he could show mercy to all. And that's not just that our, our heavenly father is just an example. If you think about Jesus even said, he commends to us as believers, be merciful even as your father is merciful. But he's not just a, an example of mercy. And so we emulate that. Though that is, that is true, it's, it's more than that. We're not supposed to just copy him, but deeply experience the mercy of God for ourselves. And out of that, a heart is changed when it receives that kind of mercy that we see God has given us through Christ. And you can't help but overflow with mercy. I have a pastor friend who not long ago, shared with a group of pastors. We were gathered together to encourage one another and just hear more of each other's stories. And he was talking about when he was younger, he was really motivated to do well, to, to make more of himself, really be successful and, and have lots of money and, and buy things. And he, so he really wanted this. And so he had his first job and it was going well. But what he decided to do when he didn't think he would get ahead fast enough was he decided to steal money from his employer. And he got away with it until he was caught and arrested. But that, that's not the, the impressive part of the story. Not, not what impressed me. What, what impressed me was his story of his parents' reaction. His parents came to the police station. They didn't ream him out. They didn't tell him how much of an idiot he is for stealing. Didn't he know he would get caught? Instead, they, they bail him out. They raise money. They have this ability to get money from others, borrow whatever they needed to do, and they bail him out. And they tell him they're going to walk through this with him. They showed him mercy. He didn't deserve it. They showed him mercy. And he tells this story through tears of the mercy of his parents. And he says that completely changed his life. Their mercy changed his life. And ultimately what we see at the end of this passage are that the enemies of God are transformed. We see the enemies of God's people, the enemies, if you're an enemy of God's people, you're an enemy of God. And as an enemy of God, deserve death. But these men aren't put to death. They're spared. They're showed mercy. And not just mercy, but lavish grace upon that mercy. They're not just given just scraps of bread and a sip of water. What does it say? They've been given a feast and time to just sit and eat. And just when they're finished, they're released to go back, back to their master. What we're seeing here at the end of this passage is a beautiful picture of the gospel. Beautiful picture of the gospel the mercy that changed the Syrians in this way, they, they, they never raided again. The same way my friend was, showed mercy and he never stole again or even had the inkling to steal. If you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, my hope is that you would hear this mercy of God that is available for you. That your eyes would be open 
Our God says his desire is for none that they would perish, but should re- reach repentance. That's his desire. His desire is that we would repent from our sin and turn to him for mercy. Because he loves to give us mercy. His desire is for us to be saved, meaning that we are separated from him by our sin. And yet he wants to show us mercy and does so through giving us Jesus. We sang that just before we started the sermon. That Jesus died for our sin. Jesus is our mercy. He pays for our sin at the cross out of mercy towards us. And we are meant to see in that the love and mercy of God, his kindness towards us. So I urge you, let God open your eyes this morning to his mercy and grace. This is what a merciful God does. This is what he does. He gives us what we don't deserve when our eyes are open to his mercy. And he just doesn't spare our lives. That would be good enough if he just just saved us from hell. If he just gave us that opportunity to have our lives back. But he continues to lavish his grace upon us. And so if we accept the offer of grace through Jesus, we are given life abundant now. We are given life that never ends for all eternity. And we're given everything that is God's we share in for all eternity. Lavishes his grace upon us. So I pray for you that, Lord, open the eyes of these people. The hope and encouragement in this is that we have a merciful God. Not that does it out of compulsion, not because he has to, because that's who he is, merciful and kind. To know his protection from our enemies, including sin and death. To know his provision, whatever means that he chooses to do and use. That is what it looks like to trust in the mercy of God. So to end, what, what are you worried about right now? What's scaring you right now? What are you fearful of? Passage says, what do you do in that fear? Pray. Pray for God's protection. Remember, he has a, a flaming army that outnumbers any ar- earthly army. It's there. He may use it, he may not, but his protection is there. Have you experienced the great mercy of God in saving you? That's what I was just talking about. Have you you experienced for yourself the merciful God who gives us his son in order to die for us? If you have, we're to show that mercy to others. We're to be changed by that mercy. And if you never have experienced that in Christ, pray to God, Lord, open my eyes to see your mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good to us. And I suspect, Lord, there are some here that, Lord, their eyes have not been opened to your mercy. And Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of those here that have not experienced your life-giving mercy through Christ. I pray that they would take that invitation to know you, to be saved by you and through you, by your grace alone. That they would turn from their sin and turn to you. And Lord, for those of us who have experienced your mercy, give us faith to trust that you will continue to be merciful, that all power and authority is given to you. You are sovereign in over all things and that you do protect us, provide for us, and continue to show us mercy. It's in your great name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Please rise. Lift up 
seated. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. I pray that mothers will have a great day today. Guys and kids, make sure you spoil your mom, your wife, your grandparents, uh, everyone who you celebrate with today. And I want to close with our benediction from God's word to another servant of his, where he says, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Go in that confidence. Amen.